couple of brief points before I let uh, our guest speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Professor Robin um, Goldstein, to uh, start uh, his presentation. Uh, uh, first of all, as you all know, awareness about Georgian wines in the United States is growing and interest toward Georgian wine is growing. We also, uh, uh, it's not just interest, but also sales of Georgian wine in the United States and import to United States is uh, growing as well, which is, I think, important good news. Uh, but we still have a lot to do in terms of building category of Georgian wine as a separate category on the US market. Uh, Georgian wine is still considered to be the niche product uh, where uh, wines like uh, natural amber wines uh, or some of the semi-sweet wines are more demanded than uh, than other categories or other segments of, of uh, wine produced in Georgia. And ultimate goal is to build comprehensive portfolio presence uh, in the United States of Georgian wines that will uh, that will really uh, present Georgia as a multifaceted producer with uh, multiple styles of wine uh, presented on the U.S. market. And that's where the uh, objective of um, uh, multiple actors involved in this process uh, is and, and focus is that uh, those actors include obviously Georgian Wine Agency who wants to promote Georgian wines in the United States. It, it includes uh, importers who want to bring more uh, Georgian wines from uh, from Georgia, distributors, obviously consumers, and us, people who want to uh, promote Georgian wine, also who want to drink Georgian wines and have uh, multiple sort of um, options uh, in the stores or restaurants. Uh, and uh, I think it's also important from my end to mention that uh, uh, there's this new renewed discussion about uh, uh, how to present Georgian wine in terms of um, uh, from as a marketing tool. Uh, what are the marketing tools that we need to use in presenting Georgian wines in U.S. market? And this this um, renewed discussion about um, uh, query wines, uh, wines made in in clay and for us buried in the ground, traditional Georgian query wines, uh, white grapes with the skin contacts. What Georgians call amber wine, Carvis Perry. And what is known on the market in the United States, orange, uh, sometimes uh, people uh, put both categories, both these uh, segments of the of the uh, wine market into one category of natural wine. So uh, whether uh, whether Georgia needs to continue pushing on amber wine, that's where we strongly believe Georgia should should go, uh, uh, push for amber as a, as a separate sort of category of the wine. Uh, uh, but some people, there are some some uh, some experts or some wine uh, connoisseurs or or uh, uh, professionals of wine who say that Georgia missed the opportunity already and and uh, and uh, orange is the uh, new category and Georgia somehow needs to jump in the orange and, or the, uh, there are others who say that it has to be a category of natural wine. I think it was an interesting case recently when CBS sixty minutes. Uh, uh, had a show for about Georgian wines, uh, how uh, interest towards amber wine, because that was the show mostly about promoting amber category of Georgian wine, uh, how that was um, reflected on demand in the US, including uh, searches on Google, as well as uh, demand in the stores and restaurants and online sales and so forth. So that's where we are. And uh, here we have the one of the probably most interesting speakers in the field of wine uh, wine uh, in general and wine economics and uh, wine industry, Professor Robert Gostin from uh, University of uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, we started uh, this conversation with Robin about natural or orange or amber or how to market Georgian wines in the United States for the last couple of years. Last year, meaning the 2002, it was at... Uh, UC Davis, when we had the Huino Forum, uh, fifth Huino Forum there. Last year, we had this conversation continuing at uh, University of Texas, Austin, and Rice University in uh, in Houston. Um, we had this you know, kind of um, more deeper dive in this subject. And today, uh, we are fortunate to have Robin, who is a not just professor, but also author, uh, journalist, writer, traveler, 
and uh, and big lover of wine uh, to discuss this subject. So uh, how U.S. market sees these different categories of wines, natural, orange, amber, and where Georgia need to focus going forward. So without further delay, sorry for this long introduction, uh, Robin, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mamuka. Uh, I am I'm joining uh, you all from Georgia, but it's uh, a different Georgia. I'm in Atlanta, Atlanta airport. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and and uh, and talk to you all about um, uh, what I what I hope to do is just basically look at some talk about some data uh, about natural wine, orange, amber wine, uh, and how it relates to uh, how, what data can tell us about about these these interesting and complicated issues about how Georgian wines could be marketed best. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start by talking about natural wine. Uh, natural wine is this trend that you know people have been hearing about more and more. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different opinions about how, uh, how important it is, how big and important the natural wine trend is. Um, uh, and I'm going to start by by looking at some data on that um, and talking about how the natural wine market could actually be defined uh, and analyzed in economics. So uh, you've probably uh, noticed that there are uh, articles everywhere talking about natural wine. Uh, this is um, New York Times, uh, uh, Wine Enthusiast, uh, New York Magazine, Better Homes and Gardens. It's, it's become a, a trend that's that's sort of widespread. It's, it's not just a uh, being talked about in the wine industry or wine world, but but uh, in the in the popular media, uh, some people uh, associate natural wine with health. Is natural wine better for you? Uh, you know, it's uh, the the fewer additives or sulfites. Uh, some people believe that it's uh, healthier. Uh, other people, in other ways, it's just a a, a trend among fancy celebrities in L.A. Um, and so this is sort of spreading around the United States. Uh, interestingly, I was actually recently in in uh, Germany giving a talk at in Bayreuth about the um, natural wine phenomenon, and there, uh, uh, wine wine students there had, had had not really heard of it. So it's it's clearly a bigger thing in the United States than in Europe, even though most natural wines are coming from Europe. Um, so uh, and and it's associated with virtue. This is an article from the New Yorker. Um, uh, millennials and it's associated with millennials younger people millennials here it says millennials with appetites for difficult beverages sour beers bitter spirits kombucha cider vinegar appreciated wines that were cloudy and effervescent with a fermented noticeably fermented funk um, wine bars celebrated previously obscure styles and regions pet nat skin contact and here georgian is mentioned uh, and so it's the idea that it, is that it's something new and it's appealing to younger people who associate the sort of, of, of classic Bordeaux or classic wine styles and bottles with uh, kind of an older generation and maybe something kind of stuffy and pretentious. And natural wine is uh, being marketed more like a craft beer in many ways. Here's a here's a here's some data from Google search uh, volume. So these, these uh, graphs here are just showing the um, amount of searches on Google for, uh, uh, the relative amount of searches in Google for these terms compared with all searches. And as you can see, organic wine, which is uh, something that's been around for uh, a term that's been around for a while since 2011 has been relatively flat. It's organic wine. Um, it's the same number of people roughly searching for it as, as uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. But natural wine, as you notice here, starts to take off around 2015, 2016, and then it surpasses organic wine uh, sometime around 2017, and now it's uh, now now people are searching for natural wine uh, about three times as much as for organic wine. Uh, and natural wine has even overtaken Robert Parker uh, in Google searches. Um, there's a, a survey called the Global Wine Opportunity Index from Wine Intelligence magazine, and uh, natural wine is now the number one uh, the number one uh, uh, category that's being uh, uh, valued by consumers uh, over organic, sustainable, environmental, and, and all these other kind of characteristics. 
Um, so uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is what is natural wine? Uh, natural wine uh, is being talked about more and more, but there's not any clear definition. And that's part of the problem for marketing and also for uh, as an economist trying to analyze the category and understand it. It's, it makes it difficult, the fact that there are, are not any easy ways of defining it. Um, Raisin is a, a natural wine app that is the, the most uh, uh, popular and used uh, software or app for uh, uh, looking for natural wine wines or wine producers or, or wine bars. Uh, there are about 2,800 wineries listed on Raisin, um, and that's increased of, of, of 2,000 over the past seven years. The um, majority of them are in the EU, but Georgia is the number four of all the countries uh, with raison listings with 107 wineries uh, listed in the app. Uh, but coming back to this question, what are natural wines? Uh, first, uh, it's important to note that natural wine is not the same thing as organic wine or biodynamic wine. There are big overlaps between these categories, uh, but the idea is that it's something different. Um, uh, you know, as you can see, people are searching now for for natural wine, not for organic wine, and uh, and so clearly these these must mean different things. Um, the uh, uh, biodynamic uh, wine, in particular, is and, and organic both are 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 categorized by certification schemes in general. So there's USDA organic. Um, you know, each each country has a different organic certification uh, scheme and rules. But in, in, in almost every country, there's it, to say that something is organic means something specific. There's a set of criteria that you must uh, meet uh, in order to be called organic. And in biodynamic uh, as well, Demeter and uh, Respect and other uh, uh, certification organizations have established these schemes where in order to qualify and put this uh, stamp on your on your wine or on your product to say that it's biodynamic, um, you must uh, meet a bunch of criteria. It, it's related to, uh, in many, in most cases, uh, to um, sulfur, uh, sulfites, and, and and other things. Uh, but with natural wine, um, there are some certification schemes, in, including the Natural Wine Association in Georgia. Uh, but what's interesting about the these certification schemes is that there are not very many uh, wineries belonging to them or signing up for them. So uh, the vast majority of, of wineries um, uh, who call themselves natural, who are making wines that are, are being marketed as natural wine, don't belong to any certification scheme. Vin Matoud uh, Nature in France is uh, the biggest, uh, but that, that's only uh, open to French uh, producers. <clears throat> and... Um, only about 500 wines in all of France are, are, are members of, of this program. So, uh, and in the United States, uh, almost none of the wines that are being marketed as natural belong to any of these certifications. Um, in Georgia, the uh, Natural Wine Association uh, requires, among other things, that you have to uh, only make wine using estate grapes. Uh, but actually, many, many natural wineries, which are very small, are, are not only using estate grapes, they're using... Uh, uh, grapes that they buy from other places um, and uh, vinifying them in these so-called natural ways. And so basically it's a mess. No one knows what is natural wine and what is not. Jancis Robinson, the famous wine critic, um, says, in my heart of hearts, I just don't think natural wine is certifiable. Um, and so it may be that to be a natural wine, you don't uh, need to be part of any certification scheme. And maybe that's not the way forward uh, for the marketing either. Um, so how can we define natural wine then? Can we define it by its sensory characteristics, uh, appearance, color, smell, taste? Uh, some uh, people identify natural wine by faults, you know, by things that are considered faults in traditional wine making, like reduction, oxygen reduction, or oxidation, retanomyces, uh, mousy off flavor, what the French call goût de souris, uh, volatile acidity, um, secondary fermentation, and other uh, characteristics like that. Uh, the problem is that uh, natural. This is a survey that uh, with my colleague Mag Magali Dubois in in uh, uh, University in uh, Dijon in uh, Burgundy Business School. Uh, we've conducted a survey of about of several hundred natural wine uh, makers, and we actually asked people uh, what uh, qualities 
are uh, okay or not okay in natural wine. And the, the sort of take home from what we learned is that there's a lot of disagreement. So 62% of people, for example, say that reduction is okay in natural wine. 38% said it's not okay. 55% said oxidation is okay. 45% say it's not okay in natural wine. Uh, and, and both reduction and oxidation, almost all traditional winemakers, I would think, would would, would say it's not okay. Um, for tanamyces, uh, uh, only 23% say it's okay, but still that's a quarter of people think that uh, Brett is okay in natural wine, and 31% say that high volatile acidity is okay. And so, you know, our conclusion from this, this, these disagreements is that you can't actually define natural wine by its uh, sensory characteristics. So can you can you define it by its production characteristics? Uh, wine growing uh, methods, organic, uh, biodynamic, as I said, you know, it can't be the same as organic or biodynamic, otherwise natural wine doesn't mean anything. Uh, uh, use of sulfites, fining and filtering, these are very common things that you hear from natural winemakers uh, uh, about their techniques that they don't use, that they use less or no sulfites, for example. And so in our survey, um, the, here you're here you're looking at these pie, pie charts. The red is uh, people saying it's not necessary for 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 natural wine, and people and the green is uh, it, it is necessary. So, uh, but people are split almost fifty fifty on whether uh, no added sulfites is necessary for natural wine or whether biodynamic certification is necessary. Uh, the vast majority, ninety seven percent, do believe that organic certification is necessary. Um, but there's also disagreement about whether fining and filtering are necessary. Um, so again, here, here the conclusion again is that there's disagreement and, and you can't define natural wine by its production characteristics. Um, and so finally, the question is, can you define it by its business characteristics, which is uh, uh, things like the size of the, of the enterprise, this uh, method of sales, direct to consumer sales is, is something that's very common with uh, natural wine and a particular a group of distributors. And so this is where we're, we've sort of ended up in our research. Um, we've, we find that the thing that really uh, uh, unites almost everyone who's making uh, or mar marketing wine as natural wine is, is their sales techniques um, and marketing techniques. Uh, uh, interestingly, the words natural wine uh, don't actually often appear on a bottle of natural wine, unlike organic or, or biodynamic. So uh, how does wine get identified as natural wine by consumers? It's an interesting question. Um, we find that uh, uh, natural wine is, is is marketed through a particular group of distributors who sell almost entirely natural wine. And, and there are many increasing numbers of stores and wine bars that are, uh, uh, and, and some restaurants as well, who are only uh, uh, selling natural wine. And so, uh, these kind of uh, specific channels of marketing from from producer to consumer going through distributors who are uh, specializing in natural wine and restaurants and bars that are specializing in natural wine um, are, are the are the in many cases the best way of defining a natural wine. Another thing is that the the design of the bottles. Uh, well, this is not universal by any means, but but the the text and design. Uh, of natural wines, these are a couple of funny examples, but the um, uh, you, you notice the similarities here with craft beer, and I think that that's not an accident. The craft beer um, market is really focused on younger people, and it's and it's focused on getting away from this traditional stuffy image of of wine that looks like a a, a traditional French Bordeaux bottle, um, and so they're doing kind of everything possible to to make the wine uh, labels and bottles look. Um, uh, unique uh, in the same way that craft beer is dis uh, distinguishing itself from traditional beer. Um, and this is a, a marketing to millennials, Gen Z, and, and so forth, I think is uh, it's also important in that regard. Um, so now I'm going to move on to talking about orange wine and amber wine. So one of the, the themes here of what I want to talk about is that uh, words really matter. Um, and the word natural wine really matters, even though it doesn't appear on the on the label. It's uh, it's this growing segment that can't be easily defined uh, by a, a normal wine characteristics. And yet you have this huge consumer groups more and more who are going into stores ask, saying, I only want natural wine. Where's your natural wine? Show me the natural wine section. Um, 
And then you also have orange wine, and, and that's a growing a segment with this big overlap uh, with natural wine. So orange wine and amber wine, let me just start by saying these mean exactly the same thing. This is skin contact white. Um, and so uh, the question of whether you call a wine orange wine or amber wine is, is purely a marketing decision. It's, it, it doesn't, there's no difference, difference in, um, in what, what the words mean uh, as as defined by the market. Now, of course, uh, uh, I know that uh, in Georgia, you know, the the way of making amber wine may, is is in many cases quite different from the way that w someone might make orange wine in Slovenia or Italy and 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 call it orange wine. But all orange wine and amber wine mean in the marketplace are is simply skin contact white. Um, and so the choice of the these words is really um, uh, mark a, a marketing decision. Um, the word orange wine was coined by David Harvey, who's a wine uh, in 2004. Um, uh, he coined the term in 2004, but pretty much no one started talking about natural uh, about orange wine in the, in the market, in the consumer market, uh, until a few years ago. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how that happened. Um, amber wine, of course, is the trans translation of the Georgian term, and so. Uh, 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 the uh, it's natural that that uh, Georgian wines are going to call themselves amber rather than orange, and that's what's being done currently, including in the uh, uh, TV segment that Mamuka mentioned. Um, but uh, there and there was a spike of interest in amber wine after that TV segment. But uh, overall, there's still very little consumer recognition of of amber wine, whereas there's actually a lot of recognition of orange wine. Um, when when Harvey uh, David Harvey um, uh, de initially defined this uh, created this term orange wine, uh, it was um, basically he sp it spread because uh, he he spread it among first among a few very influential kind of wine people wine uh, experts Jamie Good Alice Fearing uh, and so forth and so in in, in two thousand and eight um, uh, people had never heard almost never heard of this term. And, and uh, Harvey says he started telling people about it around then. Um, from the beginning, uh, when people started talking about orange wine, they were mentioning Georgia. Um, it, it, this is in David Harvey's uh, uh, essay here. He says, the renaissance or emergence of quality in Georgia postdates this period. That's a very contestable statement. He said, at 1997 um, it was, a, was a big, uh, was when sort of, uh, in, production of orange wines started to in, increase in polio in Italy. Um, but, uh, but there is this perception, um, unfortunately for the Georgian marketing, there's this perception that the, the top, the so-called top orange wines are Italian and Slovenia, Slovenian, even though this, this method has been used in Georgia for thousands of years and Georgia is arguably uh, the capital uh, of orange or amber wine. Uh, this is again Google search uh, results, Google, Google search volume. Uh, you can see there's a huge spike in on in May 2020. This is when it really starts to take off, and it's it's growing. Searches for orange wine are growing since then. What happened in May 2020? Well, uh, New York Times. Eric Asimov uh, wrote an article about orange wine in New York Times, and that's when it really started taking off. Um, and and Asimov did uh, mention in his article. Some people use the phrase amber wine, uh, and but most have settled on orange wine. Uh, and so, and then he mentions also uh, it, that uh, wines like this are the oldest form of white stretching back centuries, if not millenniums. If in some parts of the world, like Georgia, white wine never stopped uh, being made this way. And so uh, Georgia again is mentioned here, but in spite of that, you have in, in Asimov's article, only one out of ten wines he mentions is Georgian, and it's the seventh wine in the in the article that's that's mentioned. And the first four are from Italy, one from Greece, and one from Portugal before a single Georgian wine uh, gets mentioned. And there's even more American orange wines than Georgian orange wines mentioned in this article that that where the where the whole phenomenon started to take off. But it really did take off, and and um, you can see here that this is comparing searches for orange wine and natural wine. Now there's as many people searching for since since May, since Asimov's article or since a year about a year after that around 2021, 
as many people are searching for the term orange wine as for natural wine. And uh, still almost nobody is searching for the term amber wine. So that's uh, one of the messages of my presentation here is that uh, marketing wine is amber wine, uh, although it's an authentic um, uh, uh, translation and it's an authentic way of talking about Georgian uh, uh, skin contact white is it's a very big uphill battle to get people to have heard of, to, to hear about the word amber wine or to look for it. Um, and this is just showing um, how, how orange wine and natural wine are really neck and neck now in terms of recognition. Um, and, and I think it's, it's important to know it's the same crowd. You know, the, the, the people who are looking for orange wine are also the natural wine consumers. People who are looking for natural wine are also the orange wine consumers. So although it's certainly not true that all, all orange wine, all skin contact white has to be natural, you could make it using a, a quivery or you could make it with tank method. You could use sulfites or not. You could make orange wine, however, uh, in, in many different ways that are, don't correspond to any of the definitions of natural wine. Uh, but but it's in in the consumer mind there's this big overlap. Um, this is a a map showing um, where people in America are looking uh, most for natural wine. This is a, a typo here. It's 2023, not 2003. Um, this is uh, San Francisco. You can see that in the, the searches for natural wine are are really happening in the urban centers, the the, the rich urban uh, 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 metropolis metropoli in america so san francisco los angeles new york austin san diego portland seattle miami denver and boston um interestingly though the, the searches for uh, orange wine are are actually more diverse uh, coming from a, a more diverse uh, range of regions uh including many college towns burlington vermont madison wisconsin uh you see some of this of course the same uh big urban centers in new york Portland, Austin, Boston, but it's it's you can see from the map that it's actually there's more widespread interest in orange wine outside the big cities uh, than than natural wine. So implications for the marketing of uh, niche marketing, I call it, of Georgian wines. Uh, first, uh, to increase aware, the goal is to increase awareness of Georgian uh, a Georgian wine and Georgia as a natural wine hub. So people. Um, need to associate Georgia with natural wine. Uh, I think many people already do. I think this is, uh, on the, we're on the right track there. Um, I think the, the more difficult challenge is to get the word amber into the sort of common lingo uh, among, even among natural wine uh, connoisseurs, they don't think of amber wine as natural wine and they may not have heard of amber wine. So marketing amber wine is an uphill battle it's easier to sell into orange wine or natural wine sections of stores, restaurants, and wine bars than there, there is no amber wine section. Um, and so sort of the first thing is this need to increase awareness of Georgia. That First of all, if Georgian wine is going to be called amber wine and being marketed as amber wine, people need to know that amber wine is orange wine because they already know what orange wine is. And so, uh, uh, and or, you know, you can talk about how... Uh, if if amber wine from Georgia is different from orange wine from other places, uh, even though it, they're both skin contact whites, then we need to figure out how to communicate to consumers and what to communicate about them about what's different about am Georgian amber than, let's say, Italian or Slovenian orange. Um, and one of the ways, of, and so here's an example of, a, a, for example, of a, a restaurant wine list that's that's using um, orange wine uh that has orange an orange wine section on the list so uh you, you you might notice that there's lots of orange wines on here none of them are from georgia um and uh there are uh, there are no um amber the, the, the word amber isn't mentioned so the, the idea is you know the, the question marketing question is should orange should amber wines being uh, be showing up on an orange wine section of a list or should there be a separate amber wine list that's dominated by Georgia of course that's the dream you know if if if, if there's an amber wine uh, list that and there's a differentiation in the consumer mind between orange and amber then Georgia could just completely dominate that segment uh, but that's a but that's a really hard challenge to, to to get to create a segment is a lot harder than to enter a segment um one way of in, uh, doing of uh, achieving some of these goals is to um increase the present of presence of Georgian amber wines in WSET and other wine training and certification programs. 
Um, another thing that I'm hoping we're going to discuss more today um, with the panel is, is whether amber wine should be identified with Quevery or um, amphora. And we have an, a similar issue with, well, I'm talking about word choice and the, the power of words. Uh, people know the word amphora and they don't know the word Quevery. So in the same way that Georgian amber needs to be identified as orange wine by people who already know orange wine, Quevery needs to be identified as um, uh, associated with amphora with people who already know the word amphora but don't know quevery. Um, and another thing I think is important is, um, is, is emphasizing the uniquely Georgian attributes on, on, on labels. So um, the, on the left side, you have examples of, um, of wines that are not particularly, uh, don't, don't jump out as you as Georgian. You know, they're not uh, uh, so unique um, and on the right, you have these these more uh, labels that are emphasizing the, the unique Georgian attributes and the quevery um, and the, or the orange color. And so I think that that's a, a successful uh, path for marketing. So that's uh, that's what I've got for you guys. And um, I'm I'm very happy to uh, open up for questions or participate in the in the panel. So thank you, welcome. Robin. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, many apologies to our participants uh, who, uh, uh, unfortunately, for some technical reasons, uh, first of all, uh, cannot join. Uh, and hopefully they will see this recording at some point. Um, let's go to um, kind of substance of discussion and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have this recording available to our uh, colleagues later. Now, we have two issues. Mamuka, I yes. think I think I just I just checked an option that maybe may enable you to turn on your video. Would you try? I will. See, you're a genius, Robin. <laughs> Sorry, I could have done that sooner. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, uh, two things uh, before we ask our audience to maybe come up with their questions. One is that U.S. market is very segmented. There are restaurants you go in and you see amber wine section. That's obviously rarity, but let's say in Washington, D.C., in New York, and some other places, there are restaurants with a section of amber wine. Bigger question is obviously is that, uh, that you raised. You know, are all the wines uh, coming from Georgia that have skin contact uh, amber wines? Let's say wines that are made in stainless steel but had skin contact during the fermentation or aging. Shall we call them amber wines or not? Uh, and uh, then uh, another question is, uh, is it a good idea to call them, let's say, orange wine? Because they are coming from stainless steel, not in query, and focus amber term, amber wine, only on the query made ones. So these are big questions. I think there needs to be some kind of special, maybe um, uh, sort of group of people involving like some people like yourself and others and myself as well and others who are working on this issue, but also people who are dealing with a daily job of selling this wine in restaurants and stores and so forth. And what would make their life easier in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, messaging? Because... Clearly, there is no clarity in, in, in messaging on uh, on this subject. Uh, and this is the, obviously a matter of conversation uh, to have. But uh, my first question to you is that, uh, like lo looking at what you already, what experience that you have and looking what is happening right now on the market and looking what's happening with Georgian wine on the US market, what would be your advice? And, and having all the sort of peculiarities of Georgian attachment to query as a concept and being this kind of uh, query itself being the attraction for US, US consumers as well as uh, sommeliers. Because the fact that uh, uh, one reason why a lot of people know about Georgian wine is because of query and concept of query and concept of uh, skin contact whites that are called amber wine. So having all this in mind, what would be your recommendation as of today, as of, uh, based on the knowledge that you have today and based on the experience that you have today, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, I think, uh, well, one, one idea that I think that I was actually talking about with Julian yesterday is uh, a certification scheme. I, I mentioned how certifications uh, don't uh, work really with natural wine, um, but 
to call something, for example, Georgian Quevery wine, imagine that there was a, a logo with a picture, like a, a stylized image of a Quevery and says Georgian Quevery. And maybe there was one kind of stamp that, and you make it easy. You don't, you don't, you're not too harsh on people. Anyone who's using Quevery can use this. You don't have to, they don't have to pay a fee. They don't have to, you know, join some organization. Um, but, but they can call it Georgian Quevery and, and, uh, and put that stamp and then, uh, and then, uh, all Georgian Quevery wines, you, you would be able to identify them. It could be a stamp on the, or a seal or a logo that goes on the label. It could be something on the, on the um, neck or, 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 or elsewhere. But it, uh, if, if consumers could identify, easily identify which wines were Quevery and which wines were not, because it's, I think part of the problem is you pick up a bottle. Um, it's, a prob- it's, a, it's a challenge for both the seller and for the buyer. Uh, to know which wines are and are not quevery, which wines are not uh, uh, amber. So you could have a quevery and seal. You could have a Georgian amber seal um, that's maybe an amber-colored, you know, logo. That, and and if if uh, we, uh, it's an, an interesting, you know, there's these interesting cases where coordination. I think coordination is very important. Uh, it, it, in many important, in uh, most ways, Georgian wines are actually not competing against each other. Um, they will come up together as the, if, if the Georgian amber or Georgian quivery amber or Georgian natural wine uh, starts to take off as a segment more and more, everybody will benefit. It's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a, a case where there's more uh, sharing the benefits than they are competing against each other. Um, and this kind of happened, for example, with Prosecco in Italy um, and other categories where, where, where con- consumers start going in and asking for Georgian, Georgian Amber or Georgian Quevery, um, then, then everyone will share the benefits. Um, and so those, so, so certifications are, um, an easy, easy, cheap certifications that, 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 where you don't have, where it's not, it's not a money-making scheme. You know, part of the problem with a lot of these certification schemes is like, as with, especially with Demeter, for example, or with Biodynamic is that, is that people are trying to make money on it and, uh, it, it, it turns into a business. There's some private organization that's trying to make money to get you to join their organization. But if if the certification, if the logo were recognizable and the certification were uh, really anyone who was who was doing the style could could get it. Um, uh, so that's 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 my first idea. I also I, I also see some questions um, in the Q and A here, and I want to uh, and these also relate exactly to what we're talking about here. Yes. What are your thoughts? Bob Quinn asks, what are your thoughts on placing terms such as Georgian natural wine, Georgian Quevery wine, skin contact, white, amber wine? Um, I, on so, the label so I, at the, at the I, end, he's in the latest, um, he adds on, the, on yeah. the label, yeah. On the label, right. So I think yeah. the way to do it is to is to have a, a logo with a picture um, and the minimum number of words possible. So skin calling it skin contact, white, amber wine is too, is too much, you know, or, and skin contact, white even is too much and it's confusing People don't know what that means. So I think, you know, three words maximum or something, keep it simple and, and use graphical, graphic imagery to, um, to uh, uh, convey uh, the category. Um, there's another question here. Why is it necessary to assert amber versus orange? Not all Georgian amber orange wines are made in Quivri or Amphora. And many orange wines from Italy are also made in Amphora. The issue is to sell wine after all. To my mind, the biggest issue is, this is an anonymous attendee, the biggest issue is consistency of quality, which is elusive to this point for too many Georgian producers. I'll add that inconsistency is an issue for too many natural winemakers too. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree on all those points, especially with natural wine. You know, Unfortunately, a lot of people associate natural wine with wine that tastes bad, you know, like wine that's off. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's not uh, untrue. It's, 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 there's there are uh, a lot of people who are making natural wine that is just disgusting and so when people uh, and and you can also make natural wine and meeting all of these criteria that taste exactly like conventional wine so um, again part of the problem with, is with the definition but it's also the association um, and so I think since you nobody ever says the word natural on the label but you know that's that's another possibility you could also say Georgian natural wine and, and try to come up with a better definition. Uh, than other people have um it's it's an interesting question why no one puts the word natural on on labels and i think it's an it, it could be a kind of a, a fad or a trend and it could be that in the future people will uh uh 
and, and Georgia could also even potentially be a leader in that. Um, but uh, uh, amber versus orange is a, a question that we've de debated a lot in, in, in Gavino and, and elsewhere. And this, this idea of um, orange is associated with a cheaper. I, I think amber, uh, amber could be the, there is a range of colors in Georgian skin contact white that, that kind of ranges from amber to orange. So, and, and typically I, I'd say the amber is the more expensive wine and the, and, the, and, and typically the more amber colored wines are more often the quivery wines. And so it could be that you use both terms and you kind of establish a, a continuum or two categories where some of them are, it could be, for example, that the tank method, uh, the, the ones that are not quivery, uh, the skin contact whites that are not quivery were marketed as orange, whereas the quivery uh, uh, wines were marketed as amber. That's another direction. That's just just an idea to throw out there. You know, yeah. Robin, to, in my experience, uh, or my practical experience dealing with wines, I should uh, say that uh, um, more detailization or more going into kind of more segmentation of these categories only will confuse uh, people. Uh, and it will take a lot of time for people start, first of all, understanding what, uh, what uh, uh, maybe one, one of them is maybe the amber or orange. And then, then even go into then, you know, lighter color or darker color or entry level or more sophisticated level. So it has a practical, it has a practical issues, uh, how to uh, handle then those wines. I mean, it, it's easier when when you are in a restaurant and you have your own sort of uh, strategy how to deal with that. And for the for your restaurant or for your wine shop, you can build this. But for like three hundred million uh, market, which is very segmented, each each state is very different and so forth. So coming uh, with some kind of one uh, uh, idea or one strategy that will fit everyone will be very difficult. So key key points here, I think you raised them, is to decide, and that's what Georgians also need to have, it, obviously, say in that process, whether, um, uh, to me personally, and nothing that comes from Georgia should be called orange one. Because orange, to me, is a very confusing term for one. and But that's just my opinion. It's one person's opinion. But everything that comes from Georgia should be amber wine and as you said amber query or amber let's say tank or whatever so but this is this is a, a kind of important kind of conclusion we should come up at some point whether we ag we agree on that or not i'm just saying that's what i'm my thinking is orange is confusing term when you talk about wine i don't know i've talked to many people who uh, and asked questions people who say that they're interested in the orange wine and Significant, I didn't do research on that, but significant number of them from my empirical experience think that some some people at least think that orange wines are made from oranges. I know it sounds funny, but yeah. that's that's a lot of uh, kind of there's an issue with that. Now there are some other questions uh, that if you want to take some of them, uh, you want to respond yeah, to Chris. Sure. Uh, Alien, yeah. So yeah. Chris, Chris says early and even. Uh, present impressions of natural wines included funkiness as an attraction of sorts. This is and always will be a small market and not what quality Georgian ambers should be associated with in the mainstream, even though some are that way. How do we overcome this in marketing and gaining market recognition, respect, and growth? Uh, yeah, I think it, it might be that this this desire, this almost consumer desire for funkiness, what some people call funkiness or what others might call flaws, traditional flaws in wines, this might actually be a, a fad. I, my guess is it's a fad and it'll blow over in a few years, actually. Um, kind of like with, you see it with craft beer, actually. Like, I think it's it's interesting to look at craft beer as a parallel where and initially, you know, America went from having like a less than 100 breweries to 10,000 breweries in a couple of decades. And everyone was making craft beer in their backyard. And a lot of it was just terrible beer, uh, like just just completely flawed uh, beer and and you know kind of the thing is consumers who want funkiness or who want flaws are actually quite fickle and they're always moving on to the next thing they don't have any loyalty to a category because what they're seeking out is not quality it's something it's some kind of novelty and so um and then you see uh, over time with craft beer that it's sort of mellowed out and actually now 
the, the most successful craft beers in the market are being made in much more traditional beer styles, lager, Hellas lager or something. Right? It's not all the this sour um, uh, kind of funky beer. There's always a, a tiny a, a niche market for some uh, very unusual styles. But I think um, I think Chris is a, absolutely right that um, you don't want you don't want quality Georgian ambers for long term sustainable strategy. You don't want them associated with with this. Uh, with these flaws, with, with 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 funky flaws, I think skin contact white is a style of wine that can be made without flaws or with flaws. I mean, ox- I mean, maybe with the exception of oxidation, because oxidation is is not actually a flaw. And there's there are regions in the world, including Georgia and Banyuls in France, for example, that were or or Sherry or Madeira, where there there's intentional oxidation. So oxidation can be intentional, and it's not a it's not a quality problem if it's made intentionally in that style um but the question of how you overcome this in marketing and getting market recognition i think part first is just patience you know it, uh, uh, allow uh, don't you know jump in and try to be part of this fad of making flawed wines make good wines and and let the let the market uh, naturally come to them over time but communicate as strongly and clearly as possible what you're selling uh coming back to this idea of of logos for example Georgian amber, Georgian quiver. I mean, there's really two things that you need to communicate most. Amber, if it's if the word's going to be amber, then uh, you know, amber make make it really clear on the on every single bottle, every single label that it's amber. Um, make it really clear that it's quiver. Just communicate clearly with words and pictures that are somehow standardized. I think that's my suggestion, anyway. Um, yeah, there's a question that, about yeah. this, if there is a FDA restrictions against natural. There is a restrictions about organic, because unless it's a U.S. organic reg- registered, you cannot bring uh, wines from abroad and call it uh, organic. Uh, so, But natural has no restrictions as far no. as I know. Not, none that I know of either. Uh, anyone can call anything natural, and that's maybe part of the problem. Uh, but it's uh, but it's but it's an opportunity in the sense that it's it is really interesting to me why why nobody has actually uh, is why very few people are using the word natural. Um, yeah. So let's the next question here is uh, from Shota. We know that production of clevery wines is quite time consuming and labor intensive. Even though there are many family wineries in Georgia, overall production of amber wines in comparison with classical styles is quite low. Additionally, exportation of orange wines is less than 8% of the whole Georgian wine export in 23. Um, do you think it can become a problem in the future if marketing will, will work and demand will increase? Does orange wines from Georgia have a capability to affect overall export of Georgian wines or niche will stay niche? This is a great question and um, very important points and a, a good uh, excuse to make another point I wanted to make today, which is that I think semi-sweet red is a really promising and interesting category. So there's uh, when you look at the U.S. market, especially the younger uh, generations, uh, you're seeing more and more interest in sweeter wines uh, than ever before. Um, traditionally, there was a sort of disdain for sweet wines uh, among uh, wine snobs or wine experts. Uh, oh, I'd never be caught dead drinking sweet wine. And there was this uh, there was this motto: uh, talk talk dry, drink sweet, talk dry. People, even people who liked sweet wines, would would be embarrassed to admit it, and it's they, so they would actually ye- yellow tail for example, from Australia, got really big by being a, essentially a sweet wine that was marketed as a dry wine. Uh, and pe- so people didn't have to admit they were drinking sweet wine. But what's really cool about a Georgian um, semi, semi-sweet Saperavi in particular is that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, at its best, it's a style that's both sweet and very sophisticated and um, uh, with, with all these interesting characteristics and tannins and, and long finish and complexity that you associate with the top wines in the world, but it's also it also has sweetness. And so, and the word semi-sweet, again, coming back to the word choice, the word semi-sweet I love because um, it's not, uh, off dry is very confusing to people, but semi-sweet is, it's saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not it's drinking a completely sweet wine. It has characteristics like dry wine, but it's also, it has uh, sugar. And so um, semi-sweet Saparavi, I think it could, it could be that that is a much bigger market in the long run for Georgia. Um, although we haven't talked about it until now. Yeah, yeah, but I think I have one comment on that. You know, about 10 years ago, even five years ago, uh, and I had kind of my own personal experience of that, telling people that this wine is semi-sweet would 
make them uh, less interested in wine. And because like right. it was not, it was sort of uh, not cool to drink sweet wines or semi-sweet wines. So we try to avoid the using term of sweet or semi-sweet. Just tell people this is a fruity or some kind of uh, attracting, interesting wine. So, but uh, more and more in last several years, I see that more openness to that uh, to to that term. But even though that's true, and and you're right, people are interested in. I think using uh, term sweet will be probably still problematic. It will drive significant number of people away from this wine. We need to come up with some something else there as well. But I know it's, it's an additional <laughs> challenge and and complexity. I don't know. Uh, Robin, I know uh, you are in, in the middle of transit because of the weather situation in the northeast corridor in the U.S. This uh, disrupted some travel, and uh, Robin is one of the victims of, of the process. So if you still have five, ten minutes, we can continue. No, no, I, have, not, then... I, I have, I, I'm not in a rush. I have plenty of time. Okay. Maybe another five, ten minutes we can continue if there are uh uh any any um interesting questions that you want to answer there is a uh marketing is about differentiation we have an opportunity by virtue of the orange amber confusion taking control or differentiating our wines is georgian amber wine which is better and different from orange funky wines there's another opportunity to differentiate our wines as georgian natural wines versus funky natural wines so yeah i i agree with that point i think uh um Georgian, I think the word Georgian should appear on the, if, if, if you, if there's a potential project to develop standardized logos or seals that go on bottles, I think the word Georgian should be an important part of it. I think it would be cool if there were Georgian script on it. Georgian script is beautiful and exotic looking to uh, people who are not familiar with it. Um, and, 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 and uh, if, if amber is the word and not orange, I agree. If you could, if amber is not identified with flaws, whereas orange is, then it could have a longer lasting power. It's just a lot of, it's just really hard. In marketing, it's really, really hard to create a new category. It's a lot easier to enter an existing one. So um, the way the way into creating the amber category is through the orange category, I think. It's, you, you, you have to uh, steal share from orange by telling people it's, amber is orange, but it's better. Don't, don't say amber is not orange. That's that's the mistake you can make. You say, oh, amber is nothing like orange. And it's like, okay, fine, forget it then. I'm looking for orange. No, amber is orange, but it's better. And Georgian is better than, uh, uh, Georgian is better than other uh, uh, skin contact white. Yeah. But Robin, don't you think that, uh, uh, I know it's costly operation, but maybe uh, some uh, deeper research, like, like polling kind research is required to understand uh, what are the uh, what is the best way to proceed going forward, uh, whether market is ready for uh, whether orange, let's say, category is ready to uh, kind of uh, allow something in that uh, category, or it's better to kind of uh, maybe jump into the more like uh, more relatively more popular natural and make amber as a part of the natural rather than rather than orange mm. so yeah. i th maybe maybe right. some some broader research uh, of of and it's i think this research needs to be segmented between consumers and, uh, separate from consumers and for the industry as well because it's mm. interesting that you know when i go let's say to taxom or events like that i see the most of the sommeliers there or even younger generation sommeliers First of all, a significant number of people visited Georgia already, thanks to funding from the uh, National Wine Agency or some private funding coming from importers and so forth. So you know awareness, you see the awareness about uh, amber wines among Somalia community. And it's much broader than general, obviously, population mm -hmm. uh, awareness in terms of uh, ratio. And almost every, every Somalia now knows about Georgian and amber wine. At least they've heard about it. So, but it's it will be different different result if we just uh, ask them uh, questions and then we'll go to let's say <laughs> and, and survey consumers. So I think that this is I think this type of research would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's always it always starts with sommeliers, so that's that's great that you're seeing so much awareness there. I've certainly everyone I've ever talked to who's into natural wine 
has has heard of Georgian wine uh, and associates Georgian wine with natural wine. Uh, uh, the uh, I, I think, you know, making it clear on the label again. I'm, I keep coming back to this, but making it clear on the label is is just is, is such an important part of it uh, because uh, for non sommeliers, for regular consumers, um, or or for people who are you know the the sort of majority of people who are who are pouring wine in in restaurants all around the country are not are not really sommeliers they're they're waiters uh or they're um or they're in small restaurants they may be restaurant owners but they're they're not um uh they're not necessarily that sophisticated about wine so just knowing knowing that this is a natural wine that they can sell it as natural knowing that it's amber so they can sell it as amber um just make it as easy as possible to to identify it uh, is there a regulatory definition of George in Georgia as to what is a Clevery wine? I've seen that's a question for you, Mamuka. I've seen you know there's yeah. there's no regulatory as long as wine spends some time. You know there are some wines that are fermented in 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 uh, Clevery, just fermented in Clevery and then moved to stainless steel, and they still consider to be Clevery wines. So uh, more sophisticated thing is about you know uh, amber kind of definition because some of the Wines spend only like hours with the skin, and in let's say Emirati, Western Georgia, there is a skin contact very, very limited. It could be very limited. Uh, it mm -hmm. still gets a color. It gets, still gets a uh, because of oxidation, maybe even darker color, but uh, not necessarily uh, like six months skin maceration like in Gahetian wines. So, uh, as long as wine spends some time in query and did some wine making process in query, it should be called. But there is no as far as I know, there's no clear definition in, 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 in or, or regulatory definition of, of query wine in Georgia. What is your is opinion this? of the rising popularity? This is from Capuchin. Rising popularity of the term zero, zero, nothing added, nothing taken away. Could it be an alternative for to the misunderstood natural term for Georgian wine? Uh, my opinion is no, I don't like the term because it's zero. First of all, the word zero is just a kind of a negative word. And uh, zero, zero, I don't know. I don't see it really. Of taking off, so I think natural. Uh, I think the word natural, Georgia, Georgia needs to just move in on the natural word more and more. Uh, uh, agreed, Robin. This is from Chris. Funky is probably a fad that will fade, or at least never become a dominant market attraction. Uh, additionally, some Georgian wines do not travel well. I have purchased Georgian wines in the U.S., which taste great in Georgia, but are not the same when open in the U.S. and are frankly undrinkable. Why is this, and how can we collectively work to present? prevent this is damaging to Georgian wine reputation when this happens. This is a huge issue for natural wine in general. Um, so, I mean, when you don't use sulfites and you don't use preservatives and you, you use all these very natural techniques, the, 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 the downside of that is the wines don't last very long and they don't travel well. Um, the, the easy answer to this is ship, ship uh, you, you have to ship in refrigerated containers, especially if you're shipping in the summer. So if, uh, if Absolutely. you're and even if you're even if but especially in the summer and it's also a matter of where the containers go in the ship so uh there's some parts of a of a ship that are like uh that are cooler than other parts and so um it's 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 about working with the right uh uh shipping companies and um and there's also ship there's also sketchy shipping companies who will tell you it's refrigerated and it's not um and so these are uh, so 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 conditions are very important, yeah, but it's also about stability of the temperature. Yeah, stability of temperature is very important. It's not just heat and uh, cool, but it's also, it also has to be stable. So it has to be uh, cellar temperature and a refrigerator is ideal for amber wine travel. So that's that's important point. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe um, last question uh, from uh, from Tillman. Oh, yeah. hi Tillman. Uh, would it maybe make sense to put support uh, the ex to support the export of amphora from Georgia and the know-how of making wine with it, in order to raise awareness of the product, target winemakers rather than only consumers? I think it's a cool idea. Uh, Ro our friend Robin Back has uh, bought some Cuvries and is making Cuvry wine in South Africa. There are some in in America. Uh, I think uh, definitely. What do you think, Mavuka? Yeah, I mean, there are a significant number of producers in Italy and Slovenia and other places importing Georgian queries and producing queries, uh, query wines there. And actually, many of these wines have on the label and the back label uh, indication they are coming from uh, query, uh, queries from Georgia. Several U.S. producers also started making wines in Georgian queries. 
in in Finger Lake and now uh, in California and Oregon as well. So this process is taking place. Also, spread of Georgian grape varietals like Saperavi and Cazzitelli, and hopefully down the road, some other grape varietals uh, grown in, in different parts of U.S. are helping as well. But uh, in general, for the promotion of category. But I think uh, I think this uh, any, anything that uh, that promotes awareness about Georgia as a winemaking country and Georgian wines as a category is definitely uh, is helpful. So, yeah, and well, I think the, the word yeah. amphora, the word yeah. uh, people need to the word the road, route to Quevery is through the, and the the word amphora, just like the route to amber is through the word orange. You start with the word that people know, and then you and then you take them to the next level. Um, any any final words of wisdom, Robin? No, just other than that, if there's an ongoing conversation about labeling um, and, and, and logos and pictures and, and ways, that, ways that the industry could get together as a whole and participate uh, co and collaborate on a, on, on, on a labeling scheme, I would love to be a part of that and we can talk more about it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, there was a question about the price range. Somewhere between 1617 to 3035 is a probably right range for... Uh, quality wines from, from amber wines. But I think we um, we will close on this. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank Robin again for uh, giving us his valuable time for this conversation. And, and uh, this is not the end of this conversation, obviously. It's a continuous process to have this discussion. Hopefully, American Association of Wine Economists is uh, hosting annual event in uh, in Switzerland this summer, where I assume Robin will be present, and I hope to be there as well yep. with our good friend Carl Storchman there, and uh, and probably we'll have some conversations there. Maybe we have to think about having a little you know, workshop in Georgia sometime this summer uh, to continue conversation on this subject. So many thanks again to our participants. Great, uh, many apologies to those who we somehow didn't manage to accept for this conversation, but this recording will be shared with them and uh, with, with our apologies. And um, many more events and uh, discussions uh, about Georgian wine, about Georgia in general, and, uh, and US-Georgian partnerships will, uh, will come through this uh, America georgia Business Council uh, platform uh, during this year. So thanks, Robin, again, and thanks to our participants. Thanks, Ramuka.